Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Friday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm ending my fifth week of teaching about God's will. For three and a half weeks I taught about how to find God's will, and then for a week and a half I've been teaching about how to follow God's will. And each one of these teachings has five teachings in the album, and then eventually I'm going to follow this up with another set about how to fulfill God's will. And some people kind of just put all of these things together, but I tell you, it's one thing to know what God's will for your life is, but it is a totally different thing to find God's plan for accomplishing that will, God's timing, and then how to continue, how to last over a long period of time. These are things that I believe when we combine them all together is going to make a profound impact on people. I've been using Moses as an example, and I talked about how that Moses missed God's timing. Moses knew God's will for his life and tried to bring deliverance to the Jews 10 years before it was time. And if you've missed any of this, I'm not going to go back and share that, but I've already shared that from Scripture. Please get the materials. And so he missed God's timing and cost himself 40 years of suffering in the wilderness that he didn't have to go through. And he cost the children of Israel 30 years extra bondage that they didn't have to go through. Man, those are profound statements, but I've backed all of this up by Scripture. You need to find out that it's not enough to just know God's will. You also have to learn how to follow. And so yesterday we were using Moses again and I was reading in Exodus chapter 3 about where the Lord appeared unto him in a burning bush. And he said, I'm going to turn aside and see this. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside, then God spoke to him. And I was making the point that you have to be looking for God. And Hebrews chapter 11 says that Moses persevered or endured by seeing him who is invisible. He was seeking God during this time in the wilderness. He wasn't trying to get away from God. He was looking for God. You know, it's amazing how that when you seek, you find. And people say, oh, well, I sought, but I didn't find. But Jeremiah 29, I believe, verse 13 says, You shall seek me, and you shall find me, when you shall search with all of your heart. As long as you can live without God controlling your life, you will. But when you get to where you are seeking God and saying, God, I want you more than anything else, it's amazing how all of a sudden you find. You just stumble upon it. And it may look accidental to other people, but I tell you, you have to seek in order to find. And that's what we were talking about. So after Moses turned aside and started uh, and saw this burning bush, God spoke to him out of the midst of this bush and started telling him that he was going to send him down to Egypt and bring the children of Israel out of bondage. And again, I've made this point before, but I know that there's people that watch new every day, and there's some people that they have been influenced more by the movie, The Ten Commandments, than they have by the Bible. And I'm not against that movie. I own it. I watch it. I think it's great. But it portrayed that Moses just was trying to forget God, go his own way, and God just all of a sudden spoke to him, and Moses just, oh, God, I can't do this. No, the Bible shows in Hebrews chapter 11 that he was enduring, that in Acts chapter 7 he knew God's will 40 years before and tried to accomplish it, and he had been standing that, God, I messed it up, but I'll do it your way. I will obey. I, he was still believing that the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. So here's the Lord telling him, now I'm going to send you down. This is the fulfillment of what he tried to do 40 years before. But look at Moses' response down here in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 11. Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Moses was feeling unworthy. He was feeling unqualified. Now let me just contrast for you that this is a totally opposite response to 40 years before when God revealed his will to Moses and says, You're going to bring the children of Israel out of slavery and Moses just thought, God, what a great choice. I can see the wisdom. Look at me. I'm second or third in command over the nation of Egypt. 
I'm this mighty general. I've got all of this wisdom. He was a beautiful person, is what it says in Acts chapter 7 and other places. And Moses just took a word from God and made a paragraph out of it. He was very self-confident and going to do things in his own might. And by, because of that, he messed up the things of God. Here he is 40 years later. God is now saying, all right, it's time. And how did Moses respond? Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh? And that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. You know what? He had changed. Moses had gotten rid of being full of Moses. Moses had come to a place that he realized that without God, he was nothing. And you know what? Every one of us, before God can use us, you've got to come to that place. You've got to reach this place to where there's only one God and you are not Him that you realize that on your own, you can do nothing. The scripture says that there is a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You know, it's amazing how, you know, I hate to make generalizations, but basically young people tend to be more cocky and self-confident than older people. And a lot of it's because they just think that everything's going to work out for them. But you know what? The older you live, you get the wind knocked out of you. Life happens. People around you die. People who are much more talented and, and anointed than you are fail. And you see tragedy and hurt. And you know what? You just come to a place to where you realize after a while, after a little bit of living, that you know what? You can't do everything. Life has a tendency to knock this arrogance out of you. And Moses, after 40 years in the wilderness and 40 years of facing every day that I failed God and I messed up the things of God, he had come to a place to where, God, who am I? How could you use me? And look what the Lord said. He said, certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. You know what? Moses had come to a place where he realized he was nothing. How could God use him? The answer is, he said, I will be with him. And this is amazing. I'm going to expound on this more as we continue to go through this teaching. This will have to be on our programs next week. But you've got to come to this place where you realize without God, I can do nothing. But you also realize that you aren't without God. And like Paul said in Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul said over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I am the least of all of the apostles. I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle. He realized that he was nothing. But then he turned around and he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The emphasis is on through Christ. See, there are some people that think I can do anything. God, you just get me introduced. You, you put me on the stage and I can take it from here. You're going to fail. You hadn't come to the end of yourself. You've got to come to the end of yourself before you find the beginning of God, before you start seeing God's power really flow in your life. There has to be a healthy recognition that you in yourself are nothing. I'm not talking about a masochist mentality to where you hate yourself. I'm just talking about a realization that God didn't make us to function independent of Him. God made man to be in union with God. And it's only when we are under His anointing and in union with Him that we reach our potential and that can be the person that God wants us to be. You've got to come to this realization that without God, you are a zero with the rim knocked off. <laughs> Man, you're nothing. But you can't live there. You've got to also realize that He says, I will be with you and that I'll, I'll use you. And even though I and myself am nothing, God on the inside of me is awesome. And you know what? I have, I'm learning. I can't say I've learned it, but I am learning how to keep these things in balance. And because of it, I'm seeing God do some great things. And so how did Moses respond when God promised that he would be with him and it would work? In verse 13, Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come to the children of Israel... And shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they shall say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? In other words, he says, I don't know how to represent you. I don't even know what your name is. I don't know anything about you. How can I do this? He was still making excuses. And this is where the Lord told him, He says, I am that I am. You tell them that I am has sent you. This is a way of God revealing himself that had never been revealed to any person before. 
This is now around 2,000 years after the fall of Adam. And this is the first time that God had ever revealed himself. And man, I can just, you know, I could just imagine that when God spoke, I am that I am, that man, the anointing, the power of God resonated inside of Moses and that man, it quickened faith on the inside of him. And God went on and told him a bunch of things here. Let me drop down to verse 18. Part of what God told Moses, he said in verse 18, And they shall hearken unto thy voice, and thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt, and make all of these demands. God said, They will hearken unto your voice. Look down in chapter 4, verse 1, And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. Moses, 40 years before this, was very arrogant, was very self-confident was very, uh, he could handle it. God, you just point me in the right direction and I can take it from here. Over 40 years, Moses had been learning that, God, I messed up everything. I got in the way. And he had been learning to get out of the way and that it had to be God. But you know what? It's just like out where I live. I live in the country and there aren't paved roads. They're just dirt roads. And they have a big ditch on both sides of the road for drainage. And especially when we have snow on the road, people begin, you know, they slide sometimes. And if they start heading for one ditch, the tendency is to just jerk the wheel on the car the opposite direction to avoid hitting this ditch. But you know what? There's a ditch on the other side. And what happens often is if a person is headed towards a ditch over here, they will overcompensate and hit a ditch on the other side. One ditch isn't better than the other ditch. The way to drive is to go right down the middle. And likewise in life, if a person like Moses recognizes that they've been self-willed, that they've been too confident in themselves, they weren't God-dependent, you know what? They will recognize that that's wrong. And so they have a tendency to overcompensate, and there's a ditch on the other side of the road. And that is to where even when God tells you that they're going to believe you, they will hearken unto you. It's going to work. I'll be with you. We get so... Uh, fearful that I, how could God ever use me that you hit a ditch on the other side of the road. You've got to come to a balance that without Christ, you are nothing. But praise God, you aren't without Christ. When you come to the end of yourself and when you begin to yield yourself and make yourself available to the Lord, God can flow through you and you can do all things through Christ. You've got to have a balance. You've got to go right down the middle in between these two extremes. It can't be, I'm going to do it all on my own, and it's certainly not God doing it all on His own. It says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, that He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all you ask or think according to the power that works in you. Notice it doesn't just say God can do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think, period. It's according to the power that works in you. You can't do it without God, but God will not do it without you. God has to flow through people. God does things according to the power that works in you. And you've got to come to the end of yourself to where you aren't self-willed and you are waiting on God and following His direction. But at the same time, you can't get so far in that direction that you just, oh God, I can do nothing. I can't minister to anybody. I can't lay hands on the sick. When he says that if you're a believer, you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. God, I can't prosper when he said that he's already commanded the blessing upon you and that you will prosper. You've got to get a balance. You know, it's like if you were going to walk on a tight rope, you have to anchor that rope at one spot and then pull in the opposite direction and have it anchored in two opposite directions and a tension between the two. Every truth from God has an apparent opposite contradictory truth. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying, but the scripture says that you're saved by grace through faith. Some people will emphasize grace and grace is just what God does for you. Other people emphasize faith and that's what you do for God, your response to God. And see, some people think that these are exclusive. They'll either emphasize grace and they'll just focus on it. That's like having a rope anchored only on one side, <laughs> amen. If it isn't pulled tight and anchored to something that is, looks opposite, it won't really sustain your weight. It's not really the truth of God. 
Faith without works is dead. Faith alone saves, but saving faith will never be alone. There will always have to be some action that you do. And th see, some people see these things as opposites and they can't reconcile them, but they have to be reconciled. It looks like an opposite, that without God I can do nothing and I can do all things through Christ. Some people look at those as being opposing forces, and yet both of those statements were made by one man, the Apostle Paul. He was the least in the kingdom of God. He wasn't even worthy to be an apostle, and yet, by the grace of God, he was who he was. He could do all things through Christ. You've got to have this balance. And, you know, it's easy. Most Christians will sit there and see an arrogant person who is just, I mean, over the top in arrogance, and they think that they can do anything, and people see that, and that's offensive. And they recognize that that's wrong. But did you know just as offensive is the opposite extreme where a person is over here with low self-esteem, God, I'm nothing, I'm the scum of the earth, how could you ever use me? Now, see, religion has actually embraced this low self-esteem and has promoted it and fostered it. And again, if it's in balance with the fact that I'm nothing, but through Christ I can do all things, well, then that's okay. But they have, they've embraced this, and there are some people that go around, and they think that by them proclaiming that, oh, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace, I'm no good, I can do nothing, you know, I'm the worst of all sinners, I'm the least of all saints, and they go around with this unworthy attitude, and they embrace it thinking that that's the way God wants you to be. God wants you to come to the end of yourself, but then He wants you to go beyond that into God and begin to start being able to say, I can do all things through Christ. And I just feel in my heart that there's some people watching this program today that you've got the part about that you're a loser on your own, by yourself, you've messed up, and you think, I can't do anything. You can identify with Moses. God said, they will hearken unto you. They will believe your voice. Moses turns right around and says, Lord, they won't believe me nor hearken unto my voice. Just opposite what God says. I'm speaking the word of God to you today that yes, you in yourself are nothing, but you in Christ are more than anything that you're facing. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And you've got to get to that place. And I'm speaking to some of you. I believe that God is speaking through me to you, and you have got to move beyond this. Somebody says, how do I do that? Look what happened to Moses. Moses was saying, God, they won't believe me. And in verse 2, the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. Now, again, you've got to get the context of this. Hebrews chapter 11 says for 40 years he had been enduring, persevering by looking at Jesus. He had been seeing God, seeing him who was unseen. He had been waiting on this moment for 40 years. And the scripture doesn't reveal that there had been any contact between God and Moses during this time. He had been looking for this for 40 years. Finally, God shows up. He's in the presence of God. God says, what's in your hand? He says, a stick. Throw it on the ground. He threw it on the ground. It became a serpent, and Moses fled from before. Now, that's significant. You know, some people don't mind handling snakes. We've seen people on television that handle snakes and do things. Moses wasn't one of those guys. <laughs> Moses was finally in the presence of God, getting the thing he had been seeking for 40 years, and he was willing to forsake it all. He was gone. He was out of there. And God told him, he says, pick up the snake by the tail. Now, even if you are a snake handler, if you're a person that handles snakes, you don't grab it by the tail. You grab a snake right behind his jaws so that if he turns and twists his body, he can't bite you. He can't put that poison in you. If you pick up a snake by the tail, you know what that's saying? That basically you are just making yourself uh, totally at the discretion of that snake. That snake can turn and bite you. You aren't in control. You have no control. For him to pick up this serpent by the snail, tail, excuse me, was, I mean, major deal. From his standpoint, it was like death. He was facing death. You know what I believe had been happening? For 40 years, Moses 
had been in Bush University. He had been going through Bible college. Bush University, 40 years. God, I'll do it your way. God, I'm not going to do it my way. I won't get in your way this time. I'll follow you. You just give me another chance. Here's God giving him a chance, and he'd at least learned part of this lesson that I can't do it, and God was basically giving him his final exam, saying, Moses, are you really going to follow me this time? Will you do anything? Will you not lean under your own understanding? Moses said, oh, God, I'll do it. So here's the test. Throw this stick down. He threw it down. It turned into a snake, and he said, pick it up by the tail. And you know what? Moses didn't have the benefit of knowing what Exodus 4.4 4 said. He hadn't written it yet. Amen. He didn't know that this snake was going to turn back into a rod. When he picked it up by the tail, from his standpoint, it was like, well, God's telling me to do this, and if I do it, i got a good chance of dying. But I'd rather die and obey God than do it my own way. That was his final exam to get out of Bush University. So he picked up that snake by the tail, and it says here in Exodus chapter 4, he put forth his hand, caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. He didn't know that that was going to happen. He was just obeying God. But you know what? He passed the test. He says, God, I'd rather die trusting you than to lean unto my own understanding. And that's what God had been waiting on for 40 years. You know, there are some of you watching this program that, again, you know what God's will for your life is, and you've messed up, and things aren't working out, and you're frustrated, and you're saying, God, what do you want? God's asking the same thing of you. Will you lay your life down? Will you trust me? Will you quit trying to do it yourself? Will you come to the end of yourself, and will you take what I say in my word and just obey it and do it? And you know what? He's going to ask you to lay your life down. This rod was Moses' uh, tool of his trade. He herded sheep, and it's what he used to fight off animals that came against his sheep. He used it to separate sheep. It had a crook in it, probably, that he used to reach down and grab sheep out of things. It was his tool of the trade. In other words, God asked him to throw his life, this, this tool of his trade, symbolism. It'd be like a mechanic today saying, will you give me all of your tools? God, can I, how can I work on a car? How can I do this if I don't have the tools? God asked him to turn his life over. He threw it down. And you know what? When you do this, many of you think, if I do that, it'll turn into a snake. It'll kill me. I can't live if I, if I give God control over my life. But God is asking you to throw your life down. And the good news is that if you will do it and trust him, it'll turn back into a rod. He'll give it back to you, but now it'll be his and he will flow through you. You know, I'm just right now up to making a major point. Really good, and I'm out of time. I'm going to have to encourage you to listen in again next week, and also, please get these materials. This teaching on Moses could save you a lot of heartache. It could really help you. So our announcer is going to give you information about how you can get these materials. I encourage you to listen and then call or write today. Andrew's complete teaching titled, How to Follow God's Will, was recorded live at a recent Gospel Truth seminar. It's available on either CD or DVD for 16 pounds. This series is also available on DVD as seen on our daily TV program. You can receive it for 16 pounds when you write or call. Or you can get today's teaching as part of the God's Will package, which includes three albums, How to Find God's Will, how to follow God's will, and how to fulfill God's will. As a bonus, the package includes the Destiny Stories DVD, highlighting four stories of people whose lives were transformed as they pursued God's will for their lives. The entire package has a catalog value of 48 pounds, but Andrew considers this teaching so important, he'd like to get it to as many people as possible. Therefore, he's offering it to you for a gift of just 40 pounds or more. Remember to specify the CD or DVD package when you order. The third audio teaching in today's series is available for three pounds when you write or call. But if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide this third CD titled, The Rod of God, Free of Charge. 
We'd like to remind you that we're offering Andrew's latest book titled, God Wants You Well for eight pounds 50. Contact us today to get your copy. You can use your credit card to order resources by telephone. Our helpline number is 01922 473 300. When calling from outside the UK, you must dial your international calling code, then 44 1922 473 300. Helpline hours are from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Or you can visit our website where you can order ministry materials 24 hours a day, seven days a week at awme.net. To write us, use the address on your screen. We hope to hear from you today. We'd like to point out Andrew's upcoming speaking schedule. Mark your calendars to come meet Andrew at one of these events and let the Word of God transform your life. He'll be in Colorado Springs for the Andrew Womack Ministers Conference, October 4th through the 8th, and in Buxton, Derbyshire in England for the Andrew Womack Ministries of Europe Ministers Conference, October 18th through the 20th. For more details on Andrew's next meeting in your area, call our helpline or visit our website at awme.net. Karis Bible College graduates are changing the world. CBC graduate Leland Shores III moved to Uganda where he met his wife, Carol, and immediately began teaching the Word of God, establishing Karis Bible College Uganda, and helping spread the gospel truth in this predominantly Christian nation. CBC Uganda is in its first year and is already having a huge impact on this growing harvest field. For more information on this and other stories, visit awmi.net. Click on Ministry News and discover what's happening at Andrew Womack Ministries. Invest yourself in Karis Bible College and Andrew Womack Ministries today. There's much more than just classroom activity at Karis Bible College. Students participate in hands-on ministry, like working on the ministry helpline. I'm a first-year student at CBC and I work in the phone center full-time. I'm a second-year student at CBC, and I work full-time in the phone ministry. 90% of the volunteers in the phone center are Karis Bible College students. Thank you for calling Andrew Womack Ministries. 80% of the employees are CBC graduates. I'm a graduate of CBC last year in 2009, and I've been working in the phone center for two years. The ministry and the college are working hand-in-hand to deliver the gospel truth every day. We're changing lives and we're changing the world one life at a time. 